Good afternoon, Welcome. everyone. <laughs> Welcome. It's nice to see you. Thank you for um, bearing with us in the in the uh, wake of some technical difficulties. But we're happy that you have joined us this afternoon. <clears throat> For those of you, um, actually, my name is Dawn Shedrick. I'm one of the co-facilitators for uh, the webinar this afternoon. So it's nice to see you all. Let me say hello in the chat to everyone. Welcome. And it would be great if we could um, start to get to know a few of you who are here. So if you don't mind just letting us know in the chat the name of your institution and what you think, you know, what are you looking to, I guess, get out of this webinar this afternoon? What do you think might be most helpful to you this afternoon? And welcome to everyone who's just joining us. Even with the best um, preparations, this, you know, online, you know, we're getting, a, a, some of you may be getting your first taste of the realities of online education. We do have to make space and be prepared, even without being prepared for specifics with technological hiccups. So in spite of that, I'm glad to see so many of you have arrived and are here with us. Okay, so we have some Columbia University colleagues, and we have a colleague from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. I know an alum of Saint of SJU. <laughs> um, Bryn Mora, okay. Nice to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Not sure what to expect. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. We're just we're glad you're here. And we're grateful to be able to support each other. Yep, and we're grateful yep. we have everyone back um, just within 10 minutes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's very exciting today. <laughs> Absolutely. So for those yep. of you who've just joined us, where everyone's sharing in the chat, we invite you to as well. If you share your home institution and what you hope to learn or what type of support you hope to gain uh, in this webinar this afternoon. And you can just let us know that in the chat. Hello, everyone. I'm looking to hear about ways to approach inclusivity and accessibility in this complex moment through online teaching. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Christina. Welcome. Allegheny College, looking for general pointers about how to deal with potentially hot topics. Welcome, Nicole. I live in Florida and teach for Fayetteville Technical Community College on a military brace. It's great to see so much diversity even amongst you know those of us who are here now, and welcome. We still have some folks that are joining us now. Welcome, good afternoon. We're just sharing and getting to know each other a little bit in the chat, just sharing our home institutions and what you hope to gain from this webinar this afternoon. Always looking for new strategies and techniques for you. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> First time teaching online in the SIFI class, okay. Wonderful. Career director at Brigham Young, teaching two online courses on career development. Wonderful. Welcome, Linda. Oh, Linda, hey. <laughs> Great. It's good to see familiar faces here. Names, <laughs> I mean. Right? <laughs> yep. Welcome. Ron, hi. Oh, thank Tiffany, you for the feedback, Tiffany. Yeah, thank you. 
Yep. Cleveland State University looking for general strategies. Wonderful. Rebecca, I've, I've been hearing this a lot from a lot of my colleagues as well. I have loads to adapt to online for the next seven weeks. University of Tennessee, welcome. Welcome, YJ. All right, well, we've got, um, I think most of the folks who were here originally have signed back in. Mm -hmm. So knowing that everyone's time is very precious right now, um, we are going to get started. Oh, and our slides disappeared. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I will just re-upload those quickly. It takes a couple minutes to get them to upload. And while you do that, Matea, I'll say again, because we've had some colleagues just join us, that this also is, you know, this is the reality of online education. Sometimes we have mm -hmm. technological glitches, Sometimes there may be issues with your, you know, your Ethernet connection, and it absolutely can trigger some anxiety. But, you know, we always tend to turn it around. And so if, you know, if this wasn't our intention this afternoon <laughs> to model this, but since it did, you know, since it did happen, um, I think we would be remiss, you know, to not share that with you, that sometimes these things do happen. And um, we can't always... We can't, there are things that we can do to prepare, but we can't always prepare for the specifics. Um, but moving with urgency and trusting, you know, that things will work out absolutely helps. I will say, say for myself, it helped us, meaning the team for this webinar this afternoon and just immediate communication, having alternative ways of communicating if you get kicked out of your classroom <laughs> or being aware of possible backup plans. I know that always helps me in the classes that I teach. Welcome again, everyone. We're just waiting for our slides to reload for our presentation this afternoon. So for those of you who are just joining us, uh, I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know your home institution, what you think would be most helpful in this webinar today, and what you're looking, you know, hopefully to gain by our time together this afternoon. Moving online for the first time. So welcome, it's, welcome to everyone, but super duper extra welcome to those of you who are braving this new territory of um, virtual and remote teaching. So we're, we're, we're grateful to have all of you here this afternoon. We're having, oh, New York DOE, we're all having problems with tech, no worries, right? <laughs> Thank you for the validation. <laughs> yep. Jacqueline. <laughs> I'm thinking that Adobe Connect may have um, hit that restart button when their server went down. So that's why mm -hmm. our room got reset to, you know, maybe a couple hours ago or something like that. Okay. So this processing step for the slides in Adobe Connect usually takes a little while. Um, but I've got the slides up on my other screen, and I think, Don, you might Same have here. the, yep, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> so maybe we'll move through, um, just to save everyone time, and then we'll um, share the slides later, too. So our agenda for today, we're going to um, do our welcome, which we've started. We're going to talk about kind of the basics of creating an inclusive community online, a classroom community. Then Dawn is going to share an example with us from teaching a course on gender and sexual identity development, which is going to be really awesome. And she and I have presented multiple times before, so she always it's amazing. I always love seeing her talk about this. Ditto. Um, yeah. <laughs> then we are going to talk about planning to respond to microaggressions or other teachable moments in classrooms, and then we will wrap up. So um, we encourage you to chat all throughout the session. We really welcome that. If you want to tweet also, this is Columbia's Twitter handle right here. So feel free to tweet. We love the conversation aspect, as you might have already gathered. So some people worry if I chat, it'll be rude, but uh, we actually love it. So chat away. 
Um, some of you have been joining us this week for our other webinars, and uh, we welcome you to continue to join us. This week we're using Adobe Connect, next week we're using Zoom, so that you can see the difference between the two platforms. And um, I did hear that Zoom went down for an hour the other day, so <laughs> it's all these platforms are, there's never going to be a perfect one. Um, so the first webinar we did was the basics of online student engagement and online instructor presence. The second one yesterday was on trauma-informed teaching and learning online. Today we're talking about inclusive online teaching and teachable moments in online classrooms. And then tomorrow, we're very excited, we have a panel of instructors who have experienced teaching in physical classrooms and online classrooms. So we hope that you can make it to that as well. And um, the recordings are going up, I'm just grabbing the link, in our YouTube channel for the School of Social Work. And uh, the first recording went up already, so that's up there. Yesterday's recording will take a little bit longer because the person who does the recordings has many other things on his plate right now and also works part time. So as, as time permits, we'll get all the recordings up and you can feel free to take a look and share. Um, the context that we're speaking from is the School of Social Work at Columbia University, our online campus, which was launched in fall 2015, and we had our first graduate in May of 2017. So we have a, a Master's of Social Work that's fully online. Students never have to come to campus if they don't want to. And our model is synchronous. So we have live online classes every week and then asynchronous homework every week. Um, we've already started to introduce myself, but I'll just say my name's Mattia Marquardt. I'm the Director of Administration for the online campus here at the School of Social Work, and I also am a lecturer, so I'm teaching online right now, a fundraising and development course, and I'll hand it over to Don. Thank you, Mattia. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> um, good afternoon again, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dawn Shedrick. I am a licensed clinical social worker. I am a lecturer in the online campus here at Columbia University School of Social Work. This semester I taught a mini course for the first half of the semester on mental health stigma and am teaching a semester long course on financial management. Um, I'm also a full time trainer and consultant. I have my own training and continuing education firm, Gentex Training and Consulting, and I've taught online in several um, graduate social work programs and also um, online and in person in a human services program at St. Joseph's College here in New York. So it's good to be with you all, oops, this afternoon. Before we get started, I do want to share an additional resource with you all to, which I think is a compliment, if you will, to this, uh, that's a compliment, excuse me, to this webinar series. So, oh, okay, there we go. Yay for PowerPoints. <laughs> See, this is what happens, folks, when we get caught up and everything gets restarted. It, it usually happens, and then our anxiety can quell a little bit. Um, so on Monday, I'm actually going to be moderating an online panel discussion um, with four dynamic, engaging, passionate, um, activists who reside at various points along the spectrum of gender identity. And this is presented to all of us. Please also feel free to share. The link is in the chat to support all of us in, in developing and continuing to develop and nurture a gen truly gender inclusive practice. So you all are welcome. Um, the link is in the chat to the RSB RSVP form. It's free. And we just ask that you RSVP so that we can send you the link on Sunday to the Adobe Classroom that we'll be using on Monday evening. So I look forward to hopefully seeing you and some of your colleagues and students are welcome as well to that event. <clears throat> so to really piggyback on our experience up until now, we are definitely, all of us, no matter how much experience we have with online education, we're navigating uncharted waters. 
And so this information, everything that we're going to be discussing is offered to support you, but it's also a reinforcement for me. We're not expected to be perfect. You're not expected, especially if this is your first rodeo time at the online education rodeo, not expected to be perfect, not expected to embody all of the principles of online pedagogy and delivering online classes. We just, we just offer this as a support and we honor and affirm all that you're doing, all that you have you know, um, endured in the transition over the past few weeks and ourselves just on a human level adjusting to this crisis that we collectively find ourselves in. So just wanted to reinforce that um, before we move forward. Um, what's in this for you? How could this be helpful today? So we're going to be talking about how to create an inclusive community classroom community online. Um, as Matia said, I'm going to share with you a case study. We're going to talk about best practices <clears throat> that we believe, you know, that we find to be successful and helpful and that certainly we wanted to share with you all. Um, because unfortunately, so, fortunately and unfortunately, sometimes we do need to respond to microaggressions online and the dynamics can be somewhat um, dissimilar than that of addressing those in person when you're in a land-based class. Okay, so we're all here together to share experiences, ask questions, please do so in the chat. We have a team, you know, that's monitoring the chat and that will, you know, make sure that, you know, we're all engaging one another. And if you have any questions that could be helpful to the group, they'll flag them to us. And the information that we share today, you know, we all add to those toolkits that continue to grow, especially in this time um, in our teaching. So most of you are already familiar with the chat. Happy to see many of you engaging in the chat. So please feel free, as Matia said, to engage in the chat, to talk with one another, to ask questions, but also share information resources, share what has worked for you, okay? Um, but for right now, if you could take a moment, oh, we already introduced ourselves in the chat. So why don't we move to the poll? And so, thank you. This is also for those of you who are not familiar or who are new to online teaching, polls are a great way to foster engagement and also to break up, I don't wanna say the monotony, but for lack of a better term, the monotony of you know straight, you know full on lecture in an online format. So the question is that I see many of you have not hesitated <laughs> to start to answer the poll. If you haven't, um, please feel free to let us know. What is your comfort level with, creative inc with creating inclusive classroom communities online, including managing difficult conversations? And just in case you're not familiar, um, as long as you, when you see that the no vote has been indicate has um, has been highlighted, that means that your vote hasn't registered. So if you select one of the other choices from five down to one in answering this question, you will see the, your actual response will have, um, I want to say the check mark, but you'll see your, the, the black dot, if you will, that is next to your response. What is your comfort Very level? Very cool to see these results. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yep. And interesting. And I'm, I must say, not, not to be dismissive of anyone's experience, I'm, I'm, I'm comforted somewhat to see that most of you are somewhat comfortable. Um, and so I'm really, really glad to hear that. And folks who aren't comfortable, we hope that this okay, will so help get you comfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so back over to you, Thanks Matia. So much, Thank you. <laughs> I feel like a newscaster when I say that. <laughs> All right. So why create an inclusive classroom community? So the premise here is that class participation is essential for learning. If students aren't able to participate and engage with the class, they're just not going to be able to learn. And um, feel free to chime in in the chat, too, if you have other thoughts about this. I love this quote here from Herbert Simon, uh, where learning results from what the student does and what the student thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. Um, and the teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. Um, so one uh, impediment to participation is students feeling like they have to take risks when they're participating in class. So if you want to let us know in the chat some thoughts about what risks are are we asking students to take when they participate in class? 
And I'm going to move us to the large chat here. All right, lots of interesting responses coming in. So judgments from other students. Thank you, mm -hmm. Cindy. Linda sharing possibly unpopular views. Yep. Nicole vocalizing opinions that may or may not be supported by classmates. Tatiana being judged. Robin opening up to possibly receiving negative feedback. Tiffany, they risk being wrong. Laura looking less than. Wendy to be vulnerable. Elizabeth exposing their own lack of knowledge or differences in opinions. Yep. So these are, and there's a lot of um, additional great answers coming in too. And I love seeing some of these familiar names and meeting new people too. So thank you. And please do continue to share your thinking. So I'm going to make this slides a little bit bigger again. So when we ask students to participate, um, you got most of these. So speaking in public, volunteering to have people look at them or to be seen, admitting they don't know the answer feeling judged if they're wrong or they're right. And then as a layer on top of that, they're doing this in front of people that they have relationships with. So the instructor has power over them. Um, and then there's also relationships with the other students in the class. And then on top of that, right now of all times, risks feel uh, not great. <laughs> Everyone is, you know, we're all experiencing trauma right now. And that's gonna heighten feelings of anxiety when approaching risk. Um, and then I just want to also point out that online um, that there's a special consideration. Um, and that is that a lot of Americans have experienced harassment online or witnessed harassment online. And it impacts their behavior online. So a lot of people are not wanting to put things online because they've seen harassment or because they've experienced harassment. And now we're putting all the students and all the faculty online. And some folks didn't want to go online for you know, uh, various personal reasons that may have been trauma-based too. And I really appreciate Agat is putting in those links. Uh, thank you. Yep. So thinking about, you know, we've got these risks in mind. We want students to participate so they can learn. So thinking about ways that students can feel comfortable participating, uh, we're going to go through some um, concepts. So community agreement, and then building community, and closing community. So community agreements, I'm going to show you some examples. So this is from the workers in the workplace course I taught. You can see it's a chalkboard. So that was a residential class. And um, the rules here were you know, using each other's strengths, what's said here stays here, acknowledging others' feelings. It was, um, it's really interesting to see what people choose to put for community agreements. It, I kind of think of it as um, the class's hopes and dreams for how we'll treat each other. And uh, it's always really lovely to see what people put. So when we teach faculty, we have an Institute on Pedagogy and Technology for Online Courses. It's a five-week intensive institute. And we do community agreements with the faculty. And you can see that faculty also, when we come together in community, we want to have lots of agreements as well. So um, kindness was the first one, being honest, listening to learn and understand. Um, being clear and straightforward with language. So all sorts of um, different ideas that faculty want as well to feel comfortable. Um, this one's from a racial identity development course. So you can see respect is in there, listening is in there, um, being brave, apologizing if needed, critiquing ideas, not people. So depending on the course, uh, there's probably gonna be different rules or agreements that your students want to come to. And then, of course, depending on the dynamics in a particular community as well. Ah, Nicole, so the use of icons, it depends on the platform. Uh, Zoom has a few icons. Adobe Connect has a bunch of icons. And then um, I'm not sure about WebEx or um, GoToMeeting. So it'll really, it depends on what you're using. 
Um, in terms of reinforcing or enforcing community agreements, one thing that I like to do is revisit them at the start of every class and recommit as a community. So we'll look at them and then we'll see, do we wanna add anything? So for example, I'm teaching a course right now on fundraising and development. Last night we had class number two um, and we added um, at the request of one of the students, the community agreement, please forgive me, my brain isn't working right now. <laughs> so, and <laughs> that's, you know, we and we all said, we understand, that is great. I, I'm probably getting the wording a little bit off, but it was basically like, let's, you know, exactly, Suzanne, that is all of us. So it was very relatable. The whole class agreed basically right away. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Fatima, yep, it is all of us. Um, now, in normal times, I'll put the community agreements as something that's scored in class, part class participation rubrics and then also in discussion forums. Um, but these days, you know, gentleness, flexibility, um, maybe the ways that you might have enforced community agreements in the past are going to be different from how you enforce community agreements right now. Um, but it is really helpful to have them um, so that you can refer back. I also want to encourage folks to avoid the term safe space for a couple reasons. Uh, one, no one's feeling particularly safe right now. So um, to have a community agreement that people feel is not an authentic one isn't going to be particularly helpful. Um, and then also there is some literature showing that calling a space safe can be considered a microaggression because marginalized students basically um, take that as a cue that their safety is going to be deprioritized over the dominant um, culture. So some alternative language is brave space, respectful community, civil, uh, anti-oppressive. So, and there's a, um, a source right there if you'd like to learn more. Ah, Matthew, yes. Above all, act as professionals. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that you're um, sharing that context too from the military. All right, so thinking about creating community agreements, what we usually do is we'll um, type agreements into the chat, just whatever folks want to have as community agreements, and then we copy paste them onto a notepad. But um, everyone's platform is different. So you might have students email you things that they want to see in community agreements and then vote on them together or create a Google Doc together or something like that. But thinking about um, ways that you might create community agreements as you move to online classes now, what are some ideas that you might be able to use? I see lots of people are typing. I love it. Great. And Amy's pointing out that community agreements can be more effective if the instructor also shares and is vulnerable. Yep. Thank you. Suzanne, great. So combination, letting some folks think about it ahead of time. So starting it in Google Docs and then when you meet in class adding kind of gives people more time to think about it. Great. Yep. So taking a bit of time. Mm -hmm. Good. I see lots of people are typing. Great, Christina's pointing out you can have a discussion on the first day. And you know, if you're moving to online from a residential or face-to-face -face class, it kind of is a restart. So it's kind of like the first day again. So as Christina's saying, um, you could ask a question that kind of starts the discussion around what community agreements that you'd like. Matthew, you've started a discussion thread on Blackboard. Great. Mm -hmm. Good, and Bewindi, thinking about the size of the class, yep. Yeah, the context is really important. So one cool thing about these webinars we've been doing is people are joining from all over. So we've got people from different continents, we've got people um, from many, many different subjects, and it's really neat to see everyone coming together to really think about how we can support our students and our education community at this time. So thinking about the different context is uh, makes a lot of sense. 
And Natalie, you incorporate self-care. So how are students going to incorporate self-care into their classes or into their lives outside of class? Great. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Abby, you, use, um, you have a colleague who uses Google Assignments for discussion threads. Great. Thank you. All right, so community agreements are an important baseline for creating that classroom community. And then thinking about building community. So um, here are a couple examples. I like to do just very short self-care breaks during the middle of class. Maybe you want to take longer breaks at this time because uh, it is, I don't know if you're experiencing this, uh, many people in yesterday's session on trauma-informed teaching and learning online shared that um, we've all been kind of having trouble focusing and there's a lot going on in our brains. So incorporating breaks into class, maybe you want to do a little bit longer or a couple instead of one or something. But you can use the breaks if you'd like to do some community building. Um, for example, Columbia has a fight song that most of our students have never heard. So um, I sometimes we'll play videos of the fight song. And I'm, so, I'm sorry, Matthias, I think you're freezing. Uh, your uh, we also is play off. kind of fun um, dance videos. I just wanted to step in very quickly, just so uh, I acknowledge everybody. Uh, yes, we're, we're working on ah, that. So, I'm seeing a note. Uh, we'll I'm take a freezing. second just ah, to regroup, okay. uh, and hopefully it won't, it won't freeze. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Matthias. I'm sorry I cut you off, but uh, we, were, we, could, we couldn't hear you. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's teamwork. Thanks, Agata. Are we back? It looks like uh, Dawn's saying we are back. Okay, great. I'm not 100% sure where the cutting off started, but Agata is going to let me know in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> you know, lots of things happening these days. <laughs> Jane, right. It was right on the topic of breaks. Nice. Yep. So um, Robin, how often do I take breaks? Usually in a one and a half hour class, I'll take one break. But these days, maybe you take a break every half hour. Um, you know, it'll depend on your subject and what's possible with the amount of time that you have. Um, but you know, kind of think about what will work for you in your context. Um, so. I'm not 100% sure where uh, the last thing was that you heard or what the last thing was that you heard. So I'll just maybe risk repeating myself. So um, you might want to show some fun videos or play music or something during breaks. Yesterday, we did a breathing exercise, um, and that's something you could do together during breaks. Um, so community building can happen during break time or before class or after class. And another thing that I like to do for community building is um, actually ask students to share what they respect about each other or appreciate about each other or, um, you know, want to uh, kind of communicate to each other that they enjoy about talking with each other or about peer learning. So um, I will ask students to share in the chat. So this is an example. What is something that you respect about your colleagues in the class? And students typed into the chat, and then the next week I had it on a slide so we could revisit. But it is really lovely to see. Um, so these this class, students appreciated that their colleagues were brave, and they were listening. They were opening up. They were open to other viewpoints. They were considerate. And that can be really lovely to know that your colleagues think that about you. So knowing that your fellow students have a, you know, things that they respect or like or appreciate about you can really help kind of build community in this time. And I think everybody could use some validations these days. So um, thinking about ways that you've built community in your classes um, in the past, maybe residentially, maybe online, what are some things that you might want to share with folks here that you might adapt 
in these days. Food, yeah, Nicole. So maybe people could show what they're like. I have a cup of coffee and I have a cup of tea. So, and actually, someone who's on this very session gave these to me once. So, <laughs> thanks, Madeline. <laughs> um, so, you know, you could kind of share that stuff. Um, yep, checking in. Oh, Matthew, wonderful telling sea stories to your students. Yep. I've seen pets are making a big appearance in classes these days. People really like to see the cats and the dogs. Yep. Um, ah, Linda, pairing up students. Yep. Suzanne, icebreakers. I got to maybe you can um, connect with Linda in private chat. Great. Tatiana, you have games and prizes. Yeah, you know, um, so you can do uh, virtual prizes. You know, I don't know if you've been sending colleagues or uh, family members virtual hugs via text. And you just write, <laughs> I'm sending you a virtual hug. And people, you know, appreciate that. So um, you could say, you know, here's a virtual prize <laughs> and have like a picture of something or, you know, everybody could do applause or something like that. Um, so you could have uh, kind of virtual prizes these days. Um, and yep, games can be very fun online too. Tiffany, you have show and tell. Abby, also show and tell. Yep. Great. Yep, Don, introducing your dogs in class today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so I see lots of great ideas of uh, how you might build community and things that you might adapt to online. And then finally, closing the community. And I really think that's important right now to think about how we're going to close community. Because for a lot of our students, coming to class is kind of a carryover from the old world order where things were normal. If you can remember two weeks ago <laughs> when things were normal. Um, and they, it might feel especially sad to leave class at the end of the semester this year of all times because you've probably been one of the stable forces in your students' lives. And when your class ends, that especially if students are graduating or if they're moving from sixth grade to middle school or um, you know, finishing undergrad and entering the job market, whatever, whatever that transition is, it's probably gonna feel like a more of an intense transition than it normally does in normal times. So um, thinking about ways you can close your community can be really uh, important for now. So um, thinking about what's worked for you in the past when you've closed your community, uh, I'd love to see some ideas. Great, Amy, create a ritual or give a transition object. So you can do printable certificates. Maybe you want to do digital badges, um, some kind of like marking the occasion. Matthew, yes, thanking them. So you thank them for the participation and attention. Wonderful. So Robin, in real life, you would, might do a potluck. And online, you might do a everyone bring their uh, whatever they're eating. <laughs> or they can type into the chat what they're eating. Although, if you have students who are Muslim, I think Ramadan might start at the end of the semester this year. So maybe think about time of day. Good, Abby, virtual graduation or virtual prom. Erin, nice, uh, ask students to write a note to students entering the class next year. Mm -hmm. Linda, you can do a group pick. So you could do that online, actually. Um, everyone come up on webcam and we'll take a screen grab. Some of our online instructors have done that um, at Columbia. Yep. Ah, Fatima, thank you for confirming. So Ramadan is at the end of the semester. So just be careful um, if you've got students who might be celebrating Ramadan, the food-based stuff is going to be pretty painful. <laughs> yep. Great, Tiffany, and ask me anything. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's a really nice opportunity to get creative when you're closing out a community. We've seen folks um, 
or some of our online instructors at the School of Social Work will have students create a quilt so everyone contributes some kind of image and then they you know put it together so it looks like a quilt that commemorates the class and I think these days some kind of meaningful ritual could be very lovely um, and then one thing that I like to do is I ask students is there a way that you would be willing or want to stay in touch with each other Maybe it's a Facebook link or a LinkedIn or a Twitter or an email or something, and then they just. Thank you, Matia. <laughs> so in the interest of time, because I certainly want to want to honor everyone's time this afternoon, I'm going to share, I'm going to hit the high notes of what I was going to share with you in this case study, if you will. So I am going to share a particular um, case study from a particular session. And then I'd like to just share some of my own reflections and best practices that I incorporate because I do tend to teach courses, you know, that do center on intersectionality, social identity, you know, race and oppression, you know, between Columbia University School of Social Work and St. Joseph's College. So in this particular situation, what I want to share with you is an experience in teaching a gender and sexual identity development course that I've taught both online and in person on campus at Columbia University School of Social Work. And I've also taught a different iteration of it at another institution. So it's um, for those of you who, um, who are not social workers, <laughs> um, uh, it's part of our human behavior in the social environment sequence, which is a foundational sequence in our education as um, social workers. We talk literally about, I share with my students, different models of gender identity development, inclusive uh, models of gender identity development, and also models of sexual orientation and sexual identity development. And so one of the things that I do, if I believe Agata or Taylor, if you don't mind sharing the link to the social identity wheel, one of the things that I do is I share, I'm going to hop around with these slides if we don't mind, I share a resource and a tool that I have found to be very useful and very helpful called the social identity wheel. And so this, you know, the quick and dirty version of this activity, it allows everyone who completes it to really check in and reflect on those aspects of our social identities and whether they are more prominent, what are the ones that are more visible to the world. It just leads us through um, what I've find to be a very powerful reflection on who we are. I find it to be very grounding for all students and myself because I complete it. It's a tool that you can complete at different points in time. And I complete it myself with the students. Um, even if I, you know, even if I assign it as an assignment to be done before class and we discuss it in class, sometimes I, we've done it together in class, but I do it as well. And it sets the context for a semester long exploration of these different aspects of our identities, in particular, gender identity and sexual identity, so that we all, you know, can have our own realizations, if you will, but it's also very grounding that we all have many different relationships to how we develop in our gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, yes, you will be able to access this and you have access to the link, um, the Wendy. Um, that's right there in the chat for you. Um, and so the social identity wheel is one of the tools that I use, like I said, as a grounding. Um, I also work with my students. We develop community agreements. For most of my courses, I have, we've developed them collaboratively in the first session. But what I did this semester in the, in the finance class that I'm teaching, we actually talked about it and set the context um, in the first class, but we developed them together in the second class so that the students actually had time to think about what is it that what is it that we can do and how, who do we have to be in order to create a brave space, you know, and a real community um, space for all of us. Found that to be um, incredibly um, enlightening and very powerful this semester, so I might do that moving forward. Um, I also share um, with boundaries, of course, my own experiences to bring to life these different, you know, issues and topics that we're discussing that we're discussing 
as it pertains to gender identity development. In my particular case, sexual identity development. I am an out, you know, queer black woman. I'm an out lesbian. If you Google me, not that I'm famous or anything, but if you Google, if anybody can access my work online, it's very clear, you know, my um, sexual identity. So it's not a secret. It's not anything that's inappropriate for me to disclose. And I share at certain points throughout the discussions my own experiences in that development to map it on for the students, especially those who might not have had similar experiences. Um, so I just want to, again, in the interest of time, I just want to share um, this particular um, realization, if you will, and a discussion that arose from it with a, with a student that I had in this particular class. She is and she identifies as an African-American, now cisgender woman, um, heterosexual, who returned back to school. So she's not necessarily a traditional age student, although I don't like to call any students traditional age, but she came back you know, to um, study for her master's degree later in life. And she, in the class before, classes before we talked about gender identity development, she would reference her own gender identity as normal or I'm not transgender. And so for those of you who are not familiar, those folks whose gender identity is in alignment, you know, with their gender expression, is in alignment with their biological sex, we're referred to as cisgender, C-I-S-G-E-N-D-E-R. Because before we had this language, most people would refer to themselves as normal, which would then automatically marginalize people who were not cisgender. People who resided at different points along the gender identity spectrum and whose identity and expression was not in alignment with their biological sex. And so this student didn't know this, she didn't have this language. And then when we started to discuss it, she had that aha moment, was like, oh, okay, I am actually cisgender. But she still, in getting used to this new terminology for her identity, because it's not as if she just learned what her identity was, she just learned more inclusive you know, language to reference that. So there were a few other students in the class who were like, okay, why won't she get this? But what I did was I invited us all to come back to our community agreements, <clears throat> um, reminded everyone of what we discussed when we completed the social identity wheel. And then we had a very rich um, discussion over the course of several classes about the value, especially for us as social workers, but for all of us, the value of affirming people's identities. I made several references back to the social identity wheel, which I think, I don't know, for lack of a better term, um, I don't want to say neutralized, but it allowed everyone to come back to a space where no matter what their gender identity was, they understand that there's value to it and that many times our identities as culture shifts, are, the labels for our identities are contextual and sometimes shift, you know, as we adopt more inclusive language. So that's just one particular scenario that I wanted to share with you, but I wanna round out this discussion with some reflections um, as an educator myself. First and foremost, before anything else, I am in a consistent practice of my own, my, um, my own consistent reflective practice. So you might not be like me since I was 13 years old. I've been journaling Dear Diary almost every day. This is my current journal. It's a coloring book journal, but it still has pages for me to write. But I can still use my colored pencils and my markers to color on the opposite page. But I reflect on my own life, my own identity. How does what's going on in the world impact who I am? Because I know that that supports me in teaching and facilitating these particular courses and, you know, and in creating an inclusive environment for all students. I take my student feedback very seriously. At the end of the semester, I sometimes I do take a deep breath before I read it when I've gotten the notification that they've been completed, but I take the students' feedback even within the class and within the evaluations quite seriously. And oftentimes I incorporate the feedback, you know, moving forward, especially if it's an indication that it will create an authentically inclusive space for um, students. I, in creating a brave space for myself, I make sure that I have a support system. 
Natia and I, you know, speak a lot. She's my friend, but also my mentor. Um, I have other mentors who are educators in different disciplines, and I lean in on them, and I create space for them to lean into me as well. I continue to pay attention to what's going on in the world, and I evaluate what that means for me and what that means for people who are marginalized and for diverse communities. So I'm not necessarily a news buff, but I keep up enough. And I also am in a practice of evaluating, deconstructing, analyzing what's going on in the world and how that's impacting different people um, who reside on this earth. And last, but certainly not least, I encourage you all, if you don't already, to adopt rituals that will support you in navigating conversations that might be challenging, um, courageous, and in actually holding each other accountable to community agreements when necessary. So myself, before I hop online for a class or if I'm teaching a webinar for continuing education, or even before I hopped onto this webinar, I just take a few moments. For me personally, I ask the universe to just support me and give me what I need to contribute to this being the best possible experience for all people, no matter who they are. Um, sometimes I literally, I'm depending if I'm broadcasting from my office, which is outside of my home, I actually like have LED candles that I might turn on. No one can see them on screen, but you know, candles always support me and help me get grounded. So just want to encourage you all to adopt any ritual or rituals that will support you as well. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Mattia. Thank, Thank you, you John. All. All right, so we're going to move through this last part kind of in a combination because we started about 15 minutes after the hour, and I know that you're here because you want this information. I also know people have to go, so we're going to try to condense it um, and not go too much longer. Um, so I want to share this really helpful tool for responding to microaggressions, and I want to give special thanks to Lauren McEnroy um, from Ohio the Ohio State University and David Byers from Bryn Mawr College. Um, they developed this tool that is just so nice and concise, and it's just applicable across any kind of a microaggression that might happen in a classroom. So the name steps, which is just a lovely, easy to remember way to address a microaggression. So you notice, you acknowledge, you make space, and then you engage the group. So you're noticing, so you recognize a microaggression happened, maybe during class, maybe in a discussion forum, Maybe you notice right away, or maybe a student draw, drew your attention to it later. And then acknowledging that as the instructor, you're the one with the power, so you it's your responsibility to help the group to sort of name it and address it together. Um, making space for students to reflect on what happened and their feelings and their uh, coming together to understand. And then engaging the class on how to move forward in a reparative way. So it's just really a lovely framework. And I think sometimes, when something happens in class and you're just um, really surprised, it's unexpected. Also, you know, as we've said many times, this is an unusual time, and um, you know, you're not exactly sure what to do. It can be really helpful to have a game plan. So the name steps is a really helpful tool for that. Um, and if you want to go really in deep, uh, Daryl Wing Su and his colleagues have uh, published micro intervention strategies and they kind of actually parallel the name steps. Um, so they're making the invisible visible, disarming the microaggression, educating the person who did the microaggression, and then seeking external intervention as needed. Um, so I'd love to open this back up. So thinking about a time that you saw or handled a microaggression or a difficult conversation or a teachable moment in class, Without sharing personal details, uh, let us know what is something that you learned about what works for addressing things that come up like that. And I see lots of people are typing. Agata's on top of those links. Thank you, Agata. Good, so God is pointing out it's helpful to address it rather than ignore it. Yeah, because ignoring a microaggression kind of normalizes it and sends a message that it's okay. So 
actually addressing it is better. Now, you might not have realized it happened. Like, you know, maybe it happened in the chat and the chat moved quickly. And when you look down, you didn't see it. So you, it's okay to address it later. Um, so Robin, stop what's happening in the class, take a breath and start with the naming. Great. Mm -hmm. Good, Tatiana. Understanding people want to be heard, seen, and valued. Good, Amy. You talked about vulnerability earlier and you're sharing now that you weren't sure if you'd committed a microaggression, so you called yourself out and addressed it. Wonderful. Avi, yep, committing to addressing them and not treating it like a joke. Jacqueline, yeah, being mindful that going online for remote learning for most of our students right now is risk-taking. Mm -hmm. Fatima, yep. You've learned over time that you might not know the right, what to say right away, and it's okay to come back to it. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Agata is validating that. Yep. Christina, make a practice of rewiring the way we talk about complex topics together. Very nice. So stop, address, move on, repeat. Good, Elizabeth, thank you for um, that question. <laughs> Ta-da, I read your mind. Uh, <laughs> so here's an example of um, how this might work in a class. And um, there's a couple um, references that Agata will get those links into the chat for us. So um, this was a microaggression that happened in the chat and um, it wasn't noticed right away, but students brought it up later. So, um, so naming happened after class was over. And then actually I'll just bring up the steps so we can walk through them together. So naming happened um, after the class, once the instructor realized that it happened. And then acknowledging happened um, when the instructor realized and then sent out a message to students and saying, you know, we're going to take some time. So then making space looked like a discussion forum before the next class. And then in the next class, discussing it live. So the discussion was both um, outside of class and inside of class and also um, by phone with the folks who felt impacted and drew attention to the incident, and then also with the person who said it or who typed it. So there, it, it's, it's kind of time consuming sometimes to deal with these things, but it really helps make the rest of the semester smooth. So it's a time saver if you think about all the other problems that could kind of snowball off of it later. And then engaging the group on discussion was in the discussion forums and in class. Yeah. So um, some of the lessons learned um, are, you know, focusing on supporting the students. There's going to be a lot of emotional reactions. And these days, um, everyone's reacting uh, emotionally, maybe more than usual. I know. Um, you know, just things happen and it's more frustrating than usual, or um, maybe like I might catch myself overreacting to something. Um, and so that's gonna happen with microaggressions too. So focusing on those emotions can be really helpful. And then collaborating when it's possible. Um, if you can find a colleague to talk it through with or um, an administrator to talk it through with, um, also, having another voice that kind of backs you up can be helpful, like maybe there's a video or another resource or an article, and then um, keeping all the students involved. Yep. Oh, good, Cheryl, wonderful. Okay. All right, so we're going to wrap up. I do want to give a shout out to our colleagues at Columbia University Center for Teaching and Learning. They have some excellent resources on inclusive teaching. They have a guide, they have a whole massive open online course, and they uh, recently published an op-ed about inclusive teaching as well. Um, so let us know, I'm gonna go back to this poll that we had earlier. Um, now that we've had this session, has anything changed? So your comfort level with creating inclusive classroom communities online, including managing difficult conversations. And then um, if you want to share in the chat anything new or helpful that you learned in this session, it's kind of a review point. So it helps 
um, us remember if we take a moment to reflect on what we learned. And also it helps our colleagues and our peers if we share what we learned because it helps reinforce their learning or point out things that they might not have noticed the first time around. And while folks are chatting, also feel free to type in questions because we'll spend time here just answering any questions that you might have. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us despite those technical difficulties at the beginning. You really made it happen. I'm very impressed. <laughs> and, you know, it can be very anxiety producing when there's technical issues, but you came in, you did it, you did a great job, you were engaged, and we really appreciate it. Good, so Robin learned ways to help create community. Nicole, numerous potential chat questions. Great, a lot of modeling, name steps, wonderful. Thank you, Nicole, thank you, Robin. Linda, ah, so um, you are someone who's not afraid to speak up in class, so it gave you that other perspective, wonderful. Vicky, it's a process addressing microaggressions, yep. Aparna, sharing the practice of grounding yourself. Mm -hmm. Amy, thank you. Marcine, information was helpful to think and do even face-to-face. -face. Good, I hope this will be helpful in the future too. Good, and Abby, yep, that fact that your students might feel even more self-conscious right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Creating community agreements at the start. Wonderful, thank you. All right, I'm gonna move to the larger chat view. And I'm glad to see, it seems like folks are feeling a little bit more comfortable than at the start, so that's wonderful. So I'm just making the chat larger so that we can um, see each other's ideas. And um, I also want to say a big, Thank you, and make space for questions and answers, too. Good, Christina, you're thinking about establishing new parameters of how we engage with each other. Yep. Thank you. I'm really glad that this was helpful despite the technical issues <laughs> and just really happy to um, have spent this time with you. And I really want to commend you all. Everyone is so busy right now, and the fact that you took the time to join us is just very, very commendable. So thank you. Great, and um, Phyllis is asking, and I see, I hear my husband talking on the thing, so I'm gonna pass it on <laughs> so I can be. Yeah, I just noticed that at the same time you mentioned it, Mattia. <laughs> um, thank you, Phyllis. Do you provide guidelines for students to point out microaggressions if the professor makes one? Um, I will share with you, um, and thank you uh, for asking that, Phyllis. I, in collaborating with my students to create community agreements, I explicitly, you know, let them know that we are all holding each other accountable, including myself. Um, and I welcome, I encourage, um, I plead with them to hold me accountable just as much as we will, you know, to each other. And that for us as the instructor, as the professor, requires some humility and a willingness, you know, to, to recognize when a student shares with us that they may have been harmed by something that we've said, even with the bit, you know, even with the best of intentions. So I think um, being open and listening and hearing what a student has to say and being willing to be held accountable to the community agreements. And even if you don't develop, like specifically develop community agreements in the way, you know, that we are when it comes to the way that we've discussed today, when it comes to issues of inclusivity, and if we really want to authentically create that brave space creates, you know, that vibrant learning community that we have to humble ourselves and that we have to be open to honoring, you know, students' experiences as well. So I, you know, always like to set the tone with that, you know, and ask my students, you know, to hold me accountable. There was one time where I held myself accountable 
um, <laughs> to um, a community agreement with something that I had said in class. Um, students even said to me, oh, I didn't necessarily find that harmful. And I said, okay, but I, you know, I'm holding myself, you know, accountable and, you know, um, was thanked for that. So I hope that addressed um, your question and you find that to be helpful. Thank you. And thank you again for asking. Watching your grace under pressure and teamwork to resolve the issues. Yeah, um, I'm so I'm just gonna tell on myself. This certainly is not the first time for me that I have encountered. <laughs> um, I've had tech issues when I've had guest speakers. Um, you know, in my courses, one of my guest speakers was abroad, when, um, who was gonna speak to my class, and everything crashed. And you know, um, I you know I told my students at the end of the semester you know, we care enough about you and your experience that we were literally willing, you know, to endure the blood, sweat, and tears. And I certainly was sweating <laughs> um, when that happened, you know, to make sure that um, we don't deny that these types of issues can arise because it's technology, right? Um, you know, so making, I don't know if making light is, you know, but just moving and grooving with it, but also still being urgent and rectifying it as soon as possible. Thank you again. If anybody who's still with us, you know, please feel free to let us know in the chat if you have any questions. We thank you um, so much for being, you know, here with us this afternoon. And of course, we hope that um, we're seeing some of your feedback, which is great. So of course, we hope that you find value um, in this as well. And you'll be able to access the recording if there's anything that you might want to go back on, if you felt that you might have missed anything, any, you know, if you're looking for any reinforcement, you will have access to the recordings of the series um, on the Columbia University School of Social Work's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And maybe we'll see you tomorrow. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to be sneaking in tomorrow as well. <laughs> Great. We'd love to connect on LinkedIn. Yes, please do. I'm actually, yeah, I'm actually spending more time on LinkedIn these days and really loving, um, you know, the networking opportunities that I'm finding. I don't know about you, Matia, because I know you're pretty active over there. Just in the past few weeks alone, like the connections are so much richer, you know, a lot of support, a lot of resources have been shared. So I'm really, really loving LinkedIn these days. Not that I never didn't love it, but certainly more engaged than I've ever been before. So have a wonderful day, everyone.